So today is the third Sunday of Easter. You heard me right. It's still Easter. I mean, how awesome is that, right? Now, you're like, how could that possibly be? Well, in the historic church calendar, the season of Easter lasts from Easter Sunday all the way to Pentecost. And so that's still weeks away. So we're still in Easter. So happy Easter, people. Jesus is still risen. We can still celebrate the resurrection because it is still Easter. We are Easter people. Now, this also is the second installment of the sermon series that we're going to be uh, going through for the next several weeks, uh, working through the letter, uh, the book, if you will, of 1 John from the New Testament. And this series is going to challenge us uh, because it's going to challenge us to live as Easter people to live into the hope of the resurrection, to follow the risen Jesus, and to speak about our faith in life-giving ways. Because I don't know whether you feel this or not, but I know I do. Um, I feel like that in our current culture, uh, when somebody says that I'm a Christian, when they make that statement, it's a loaded statement. It could mean a lot of stuff, right? Right? There are all kinds of ways to interpret that. And there are all kinds of people who have negative opinions about Christians and what Christians believe, primarily because of what they have heard and what they've experienced. Because it feels like sometimes the Christians or the people who are claiming to be Christians that are talking the loudest don't really uh, seem to be representing all the rest of us. Now, uh, sometimes this can be a problem. I mean, we're, we're trying to figure this out, right? If you're, you're talking about being a Christian to other people, there, were, there are some things perhaps that would make it a little easier for you to be able to break down exactly what that means. Maybe if we had a card that we could carry, you could just sort of take out your Christian card and say, here's my Christian card. This is what it means. That you, you laugh, but somebody's already tried this, all right? Because I found this ad from a magazine from way back in the day. All right? <laughs> this is so fantastic. I've been holding on to this for so long. All right. The Jesus Christ identification card. Okay, so here's what it says. Get your own personalized Jesus Christ ID card to carry in wallet or purse. Made of plastic and beautiful color. All right. Order this unique card honoring our blessed Lord and Savior. It could change your life. Your identification embossed into plastic. Send name, address, Christian denomination, birth date, social security number <laughs> with two bucks to Jesus ID card PO box 3446. Right, come on, how awesome would this be if we could just have one of these, right? You could just sort of, you know, whip that card out in those moments when, you know, somebody asked you about your faith, it would have your name, address, denomination, and my social security card right there, you know, all in one. <laughs> and I love the description. It says, this card will change your life, and then just sort of leaves it there, you know? Like, it doesn't really impact it. But at least you would be a card-carrying Christian if you had one. It would be nice if that was as easy uh, as it had to be, but unfortunately, it's not. And seriously, there are a lot of people who have such negative opinions about Christians and about what Christians believe. And as I said, it's mostly because um, the Christians who are speaking the loudest about their beliefs are the ones that don't appear to be following Jesus all that closely. So let me unpack this just a bit. So when you meet somebody at a party or a social gathering or on an airplane, um, and what is the, generally the first thing that they ask you? What do you do for a living? All right? So for most of y'all, you can just tell them what you do for a living, and you don't have to worry about the conversation that comes next. <laughs> but for me, <laughs> and for Pastor Britta, and for anybody who works in a church or whatever, right, as soon as I, because I, I know, as soon as I tell them, like, I'm a pastor, then I know the conversation is going to lead to a particular place, 
right? We're going to talk about the stuff. We're going to talk about church, whether they hate church, like church, go to church, don't go to church. I used to go to church. I mean, we're going to have those conversations about faith. It's inevitable. Sometimes I wish that I could just give them another answer and just be dishonest, but I can't, you know. But sometimes I wish I could say, well, you know, really, here's what I'm into right now. I'm into producing these plastic Jesus Christ identification cards. (laughs) (laughs) Came back to it. All right, so... But I tell them I'm a pastor, and then it goes, you know, the conversation. So that there are times in your life as well. So even if you have these conversations with strangers or with people that maybe that you've known for a while, and they start to pick up that there's something going on, you go to church. You know, you, you, have, uh, you, know, you have evidences of faith. There's something that happens in the conversation that you have with them sometimes where they know that you're a Christian. So they start to ask you about it. Like, what does that mean for you? You're a Christian. So what kind of Christian are you? Like, are you, you know, what do you believe? And so if you're like me, a lot of times what happens is in the midst of those conversations, I start using qualifiers, right? I'll say, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of those kinds of Christians, right? I'm not one of the uh, angry, judgmental, protesty, boycotty kind of Christians, right? I mean, you, you try, to, try to make a qualification, you know, because you, you're wanting them to, to have an, an end, right? You know, you can feel, you can sense that perhaps there's some obstacles there that you want to overcome. Or maybe you're just trying to figure out how to talk about being a Christian because you're struggling with these very things. And see, what happens is when we start to make qualifications, when we start to say, well, this is the kind of Christian that I am, what we're admitting ultimately is that there are divisions amongst Christians. That's the reality. We are divided. Christians have differences of opinion about a lot of stuff. In fact, at the last presidential election, it was said that it was Christians who made the difference in the outcome of the election because they voted overwhelmingly for one candidate over another. But the fact of the matter is that there were at least as many Christians who didn't vote for that candidate. Christians are divided over major issues like gun control and abortion and same-sex marriage. They're divided over war and the economy and over the environment. And they're also divided over theological issues. They're divided over the interpretation of Scripture. They're divided over ideas about baptism and communion. They're divided over ideas about who gets to preach and who doesn't. They're divided over ideas about who's included and excluded over heaven and hell and who gets in and who doesn't. So we're divided over a bunch of stuff. These are the differences that exist. But guess what? I'm here to tell you something very profound. Those differences are a distraction. They are a distraction. And they are a distraction, uh, I believe, that has been embedded within Christian culture by an enemy who definitely wants to break us apart and keep us distracted from what is the most important thing of all. And that is the power of the resurrection, the great love of God through Jesus Christ. And we as Easter people are compelled to tell that story. And that is indeed what we are going to be focused on throughout this sermon series, is what it means to bear witness. And by bearing witness, it's the Bible's way of saying that I'm going to share what God has done in my life. I'm going to share the transformation that I've experienced through the great love of God and the power of the resurrection. Because Jesus, who was God's son, God took on human form in the person of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died and was buried and was raised again to new life so that you and I don't have to fear sin and death any longer. We don't have to live in dread. We can live in joy and anticipation of what God is going to do. Because of the great love that God has for us, we are compelled then to show that love to the world. This is what we should be focused on. This is indeed what Christianity should be all about, right? This is the focus that all of us should should have. Now, does that mean that we're all going to be in agreement with one another? No, but it does mean that we can be unified. Unity doesn't mean conformity. We don't have to be conformed to one another's ideas and expectations, but we should be unified around that one compelling thing, that God's love through Jesus Christ did something amazing that transformed everything for you and for me and for all of creation. 
Come on now. That's some good preaching. I'm preaching on two days of preparation here. Because I was on vacation. <laughs> but the whole time I was thinking, I got something going. There's something here, right? And, and so Pastor Britta did a great job last week of setting this up and, and explaining to us that this thing that we need to be focused on, you know, this idea that we need to be focused on, it compels us uh, to, to speak up. It compels us to share. You know, because if we don't speak up, if the Easter people aren't speaking up, then people are going to listen to whoever's talking. And in order for us to do that, Pastor Britta talked about how we need to be in fellowship. We need to have those connections, those relationships. So then when we speak up, our message can be heard. Now, today we're going to take another step in this journey through, the, the first, through first John. And what we're going to learn today is something very important. So if people are wondering what it means to be a Christian, uh, this is the definition. A Christian is someone whose ultimate goal is to become more and more like Jesus. Period. A Christian is someone whose ultimate goal is to become more and more like Jesus. So somebody who claims to be a Christian but seems to have no desire whatsoever to become more and more like Jesus, you have to wonder whether they have some wrong-headed notions about what it really means to be a Christian. Because in the end, becoming more and more like Jesus every single day is what it means to be a Christian. So what does that look like exactly? Well, the good news is we have a great conversation partner uh, in 1 John, and we're going to unpack a little bit of 1 John today, uh, and uh, we're going to be digging into 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. And uh, I need to say a couple of things about 1 John. First of all, uh, it is a letter, okay? So we call these books of the Bible. Uh, that's kind of a churchy thing that we do. But it actually is, is pretty accurate in a way uh, because they are books of the Bible. The Bible isn't a monolithic book. Uh, it's a library, and it's full of books that are full of things like poetry and history and prophecy and eyewitness accounts and letters like the one that we're going to be reading today. Uh, we call them epistle because that's a Greek word that just means letter. Now, this letter was written uh, sometime in the late first century by a man who scholars have come to call the elder. Now, it's given the name of John, and a lot of people assume that these letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, were all written uh, by the same person, which is not true. Uh, they all, uh, all often assume that they're written by John the Beloved Disciple, which most reputable, reputable whew, that's hard to say, most reputable scholars uh, don't agree with that assessment. In fact, um, they don't really know a whole lot about who wrote this other than he was an elder, he was a leader in the church, and he was writing sometime in the late first century to a group of Christians who were struggling. Get this, they were struggling to understand what it meant to really be a Christian. Because when you said that you were a Christian in the first century, there were all kinds of ways to interpret that. Because there were all kinds of different groups that were claiming this is the correct way to be a Christian. And so this elder is writing to these early Christians in the, in the late first century, seeking to refocus them on the main thing. Does any of this sound kind of familiar? It's what I just said, right? It's like what's happening in our own culture was happening in the late first century. And what he was trying to get them focused on was how God became one of us in Jesus, how Jesus suffered and died and was raised from the dead to give us all new life, and how this incredible love that God has for us, that God demonstrated by becoming one of us in order to rescue all of us, that great love is love that you and I should embody as we try to become more and more like Jesus. And so let's read uh, what the elder has to say when he talks about how being a Christian means that you live in the example of that great love, stumbling after Jesus as best you can. So in verse 1 of chapter 3 of 1 John, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That's an awesome verse, isn't it? See what great love the Father has lavished on us. This is what you need to be focused on, he says. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, 
And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who has done what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appears was to, appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or their brother and sister. Now, this sounds kind of hard, but really what he's setting up is something important because he's basically saying to these people, all of this stuff, right? All of this stuff that I've just been telling you about sinning and not sinning and so forth, all of this is dependent not on you, but upon Jesus because you are now in him. If you are following him, if you are becoming more and more like him, this is what you will become. For this message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. You could sum up the basic idea of Christianity from John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16. For John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And this verse, John, 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, becoming more and more like him. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? So what the elder is doing here is he's addressing some, actual, he's actually addressing some false teaching. Now, it's hard sometimes when you're looking at one side of a letter to really understand what's going on, um, but what's happening in this entire letter really is the elder is addressing some false teaching that occurred in this community of faith. It appears there were people who were teaching this group of Christians that Jesus could not have been human, that Jesus was not human. He may have appeared to be human. He may have appeared to suffer and die, but he really didn't because he was not human, because being human was bad. You know, being human was not good. To be human meant that you had temptations, that you had lusts and you had desires and, and you made mistakes and you were awful sometimes. To be human was not great and therefore Jesus could not be human. And so uh, what you need to do then if you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to be a Christian, is you need to deny the humanity. You need to, to, you know, to just shove all that down. You need to become perfect. You need to be holy. And so what the elder is saying essentially is no. He's pushing back against that. These teachers taught uh, these, these things, and as a result of it, they lost the idea of divine love. They lost the connection that the elder was trying to make between God and humanity, that God so loved the world that he became human, that he took on human form, that he understands intimately what it's like to be us. These teachers lost sight of this, and they began to focus instead on behavior modification, the first century had no monopoly on false teachers. I mean, they've been around for a very long time. And we still have the same kind of thing happening in Christian culture today. There are people that are still teaching this kind of thing. They sort of brush through and gloss over the great love and grace of God. They gloss over the idea of the resurrection and what it means for all of us and for all of creation and move straight into behavior modification because all of this is bad. 
It's just like Beth said earlier in the confession, that Jesus didn't go to the cross because we are so bad. He went to the cross because God's love is so great and God's love is so good. And so when these teachers that are doing this kind of thing, they focus on this, they lose uh, this capacity to speak about the love of God and focus almost entirely on what they perceive to be God's anger and judgment. But what the elder does here in 1 John chapter 3 is he said that it all comes down to the love of God in Jesus. And this love that God shared with us through his son is the kind of love that leads us to eternal life both now and forever. And he exhorts these people to step into this because the time is of the essence. There's an urgency here in his voice. And that urgency is warranted because this kind of love, this kind of life that they were stepping into to follow Jesus, to become more and more like him, to live that sacrificial love uh, for the sake of the world, that was going to sustain them through persecution and even martyrdom, which is what was to come. And here's something amazing. The elder essentially states here, although it doesn't seem like it in some of the ways that he's wording this, but what he's essentially stating here is that you need to step into this and do it imperfectly. You're going you're gonna to fall. You're going to stumble. You don't know what you yet will be, but you must keep moving. You must keep following Jesus. You need to return to the focus and the center of your faith because when you do, all of this other, all this other stuff is going to fall into line. Belief will actually precede the appearance of it, Right? So as you begin, uh, your beliefs will, 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 uh, will guide your actions. That's what he's trying to say. Uh, belief and behavior are linked. So when you focus on Jesus, when you focus on becoming more and more like him, all of the rest of the stuff is going to fall into place. St. Augustine once said, love God and do what you want. Isn't that awesome? That's like the greatest thing you've ever heard, right? You're like, yes. Right, but here's the catch, Right? What he was trying to say was that if you love God, if you truly want to be like Jesus, if you're trying to become more and more like Christ, then the things that you want will be the things that God wants. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and God's justice and all the other things, all the other things will be added to you, will happen, will fall into place. That's what the elder is trying to teach them, to become more and more like Jesus. Because a Christian is someone whose ultimate goal is to become more and more like Jesus. Now, how do we apply this practically? Like, what do we do with this? Because it's obvious as we look around, and maybe even our own lives, that we're struggling sometimes to become more like Jesus. And there are lots of Christians who have kind of just abandoned that idea altogether because they become comfortable with the status quo. You know, these are the Christians that, that and, and there's some of us who've done the same thing. You know, we will complain and complain and complain about how we're being persecuted, how we're being marginalized, yet there seems to be so very many of us, right? And, and so these same people who complain about the persecution that they're experiencing, they'll, get, they'll leave their really expansive homes and get into their fancy cars and drive to their mega church and get some coffee at the coffee shop and have some really great entertainment and they're happy because it's the status quo and they're comfortable and most of us find ourselves in that same sort of situation if we're not being careful because it's easy to stay in the status quo so what does it look like to be like Jesus well according to first John thank God, it doesn't look like perfection. In fact, the truth of becoming more like Jesus often comes before the appearance. You will hold this in your heart as you step into it, and you will become more and more like him every day if that is your desire. If you want to be like Jesus, you will stumble and you will fall. But if we desire to be like Jesus, that will guide us and it will change everything. And then and only then will we begin to look like Christians. So what does it look like to be like Jesus, to become more and more like him? Well, it's when in a culture of individualism, when everything seems to be about what I want and what I desire and my success and what I can achieve, Christians, those of us who are becoming more and more like Jesus, we speak of the importance of community, 
of being together, of the power of, of what happens is when we are gathered together in the name of Jesus, that the risen Christ is there with us. We speak about how we are better together, how we are better when there are those who are being excluded that are now included, when there are those that are not welcome at our tables of fellowship, then we are all unwelcome. When we begin to speak of those things, we become more and more like Jesus. We become more and more like Jesus when others around us are finding security and violence. When those who are becoming more and more like Jesus instead speak about forgiveness and peace. When we speak about embracing our enemies and laying down our weapons and breaking the cycle of violence and protecting the innocent and practicing sacrificial love like Jesus did, that's when we become more and more like Jesus. When the society around us seems to increasingly find identity in social networking and consumerism and ideas of success and power, people who are becoming more and more like Jesus speak of baptism, about dying to themselves, and about the first becoming last and the last becoming first, about losing their lives in order to find it, about finding their identity, not in the world's idea of success, but in Christ, crucified, buried, and raised from the dead to new life. When others are turning away the marginalized and the outcasts and those who are on the outside looking in, those who are becoming more and more like Jesus, speak about moving to those margins, moving to the outcast, widening the circle so that everyone feels included and all have enough. In other words, people who are becoming more and more like Jesus speak and act with love, the kind of love that God has for the world, the kind of love that changed everything for you and for me. In the second century, it was a plague that struck the Roman Empire, and there were many cities that were actually quarantined, and by quarantine, what they would do is they would place armed guards around every entrance to the city, and they would keep everyone uh, that was in the city from getting out, and they would also try to keep people from getting in but mostly from getting out. So if your city was quarantined and the plague had struck it, you were on your own. But there was a story of one particular city where there was a group of people that made their way back into the city to care for those who were dying. And many of these people died along with the people that they were caring for. And these Christians, these Christians, these groups of Christians who were the heirs the descendants of those who read these stories, who read the books, the letters from the elder, who had been reminded of what was most important. These Christians, they didn't care uh, about what the cost was to themselves. They didn't send their thoughts and prayers on Facebook. They didn't say, come on, they didn't say that the reason the plague happened was that God was judging sinners and reprobates. Come on now. They went, they practiced sacrificial love, and this is what was said of them. See how they love. See how they love. Is that what is said of us? See how they love? Beloved, it's time for us to bear witness to the love that we've been shown. It's time for us to be Easter people. It's time for us to start speaking and then let our speech become acts of love. It start, it's time for us to begin to imperfectly imitate Jesus, stumbling after him as best we can to become more and more like him. Because, sisters and brothers, a Christian, a Christian is someone whose ultimate goal is to be more and more like Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we are grateful for this opportunity to gather together and to rejoice that we gather in the name of the risen Christ who gave us this promise that whenever two or more are gathered together in his name that he is there in their midst. And God, we claim that promise today. And we pray that we'd, we would be enlivened by the spirit of the risen Christ, that we would be given the courage to step forward and to speak up. And God, to share our faith, to share what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to be children of the resurrection. And God, to imperfectly try to imitate your son,
in all that we do, knowing that we're going to fall short, knowing that we're not always going to do it right, but that our desires and our heart is to be like him, God, you will lead us closer and closer and closer to your son. And we pray now in the words that he taught his disciples to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.